good morning to one and all uh, myself uh, dr narayan from uh, i am uh, professor in department of ec senior member uh, iitpl and advisor iitpl svt student chapter uh, and dean rnd of sai vidya institute of technology i on behalf of uh, department of ec would like to welcome our honorable speaker for today dr uh, ss mantha uh, we are really honored to have such a great speaker for today and i really thank uh, professor mantha for accepting our humble invitation uh, dr ss mantha is an eminent academician and able administrator he was the chairman of aict starting from uh, 5th january 2012 up to 4th january 2015 for the period of 3 years he joined aict in march 2009 as its vice chairman and has been in forefront of bringing in some of the radical changes for the transparency and accountability in its administration on completion of tenure at aict worked as a professor of robotics cad cam and ai in the department of mechanical engineering vgti mumbai and super animated on 31st may 2016 he holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from ms university baroda and a masters degree in mechanical engineering in vgti mumbai for a small beginning he has pro uh, progressed to be the professor and head of department of mechanical engineering a position he held for 6 years at vgti subsequent to which he was appointed as pro uh, chancellor sndt women's university at by the government of maharashtra which he served for 2 years with this distinction he specializes in robotics which has taught for more than 15 years out of which uh, rich teaching experience of more than 25 years along with the courses in control theory and artificial intelligence he was instrumental in setting up the state of art robotics cad cam laboratory in vgti providing consultancy in the area of industrial automation to the industries in mumbai and pune his research institute uh, research in, uh, interest in the area also uh, seen to provide expertise to drdo on bark uh, projects a phd in combustion modeling from university of mumbai he has also held several administrative assignments Uh, he did uh, that he did in university of mumbai also being the dean faculty of technology as a recognition government of maharashtra confirmed him the best teacher award of the state in the year 2002 he is implemented the first e governance project automated the workflows department of higher education government of maharashtra in 1995 further he provided it expertise and it initiatives for several departments for government of maharashtra He is also a recipient of Infocom CMI National Telecom Award for 2012, the 10, and HR Nexus HR Networking Leadership Award in the field of education 2010. The e-governance project implemented in AICT has also won the Silver Edge Award in, uh, uh, instituted by the United Business Media and Information Week and Good Governance National Institute of Technology Award 2010. So there are several achievements of Professor uh, Mantha. Really, we are honored to have him. He is also the adjunct faculty in National Institute of Advanced Studies and the Chancellor of KL University in Andhra Pradesh, along with being a MNS pro professor in BGTI Mumbai. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time, uh, and we are, we are really honored to have you, sir. Welcome, you, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for. Uh... the introduction uh first of all uh, good morning uh, to all of you and good morning uh, sir yeah good morning now my yeah i, I hope uh, the presentation is visible to all yes sir yes sir yeah yeah so uh, good morning to all the uh, faculty the students and all the invited uh, guests uh, for this webinar uh, i will be uh, taking you through to some of the um, some of the issues or the some some of the concerns of the higher education sector the way it has grown and the challenges that uh, you know, we currently have and the progress forward so um looking at the uh, the higher education space is extremely uh, large in the country and we need to really understand what has happened with higher education in the past what is happening currently and where we will be in future so today i have an agenda where i'll speak very briefly about our ancient education system 
the current status the changing contours how the higher education space is uh, is changing contours it's it's changing in time because of time because of the boundary conditions that are changing and so on universities in india how they have progressed in time some of the important aspects of a university are its research ipr and patents let's see where we figure amongst the universities in the world then i would uh, speak a little about the german model and how it can be useful from an indian perspective then the vocational education and training the quality aspects once we have seen all this we will look at the new education paradigm post covid 19 how is it going to evolve subsequent to what we are seeing today then the how the learning 4.0 or the industry how does the industry affect the university system what are the new skills required the blended learning its future and of course the universities of future how will the universities look like in future so this is the agenda that we'll have today the spirit of education in the past and in today i mean uh, in the past today and in future will be anu badra krutavo yantu vishvatah let noble thoughts come to us from every side that's the spirit of education whether in the past whether currently in the university systems or in the education space that we have or in future so noble thoughts is something that must be there in the earlier ancient system we had a gurukul system of education as we all know adi shankara lived in the 8th century we all know that he had four disciples padmapada hastamalaka tratakacharya and sureshwara they were all institutions to themselves and they set up the monasteries or or mathas as we know and propagated hinduism in the country mahabharat is something that happened much earlier to that and we all know ekalavya who learned purely competency based skills that's archery when his master dronacharya refused to teach him he taught himself and in a kind of distance or online mode as we would call today in the ancient times they taught shiksha phonetics vyakarana which is grammar jyotisha or astronomy arthashastra economics dharma shastra by which our religion stands by or the laws that define our lives shastra vidya or art of warfare and fine arts prala vidya these were taught in the ancient times and we had universities such as nalanda takshila ujjain vikramashila universities and various subjects like architecture art painting logic grammar philosophy astronomy literature buddhism hinduism arthya shastra economics politics law and medicine they were all taught in the ancient universities that we had takshila specialized in the study of medicine while ujjain specialized in astronomy nalanda which is the biggest of all these centers they handled all branches of knowledge and sometimes had 10000 students and more in the university so that was the ancient system that we had very brief so we will come back to the current status what do we have today we have a very robust higher education system with almost 1000 universities 45000 colleges which have stood times of the test though the downside is that it never reached everyone the higher education gr as we all know is 25 and even that is disrupted because of the covid pandemic since mid march this year so there are two problems that we have to contend with one is those who were 
in the college that 25 out of 100 every 100 students who are in the college their education has been disrupted and of course those who are outside who are into distance learning and and various other forms of learning skills and so on their education is also disturbed so both the both the problems have come at the same time because of covid pandemic and we need to really relook at the education systems that we have because of the changing conditions or changing environment now this is a world report that i have there is an this immediate disruption in education has an estimated 20000 higher education institutions closed down affecting learning opportunities of almost 2 lakh plus students worldwide these are just closed down because they had no means of running them once the pandemic struck on the other side the impressive part is there is a switch to distance education online learning e learning and mixed mode of education delivery or or in technical education space we call it blended learning there has been a very negative impact on equity in the earlier days the disadvantaged students had some means of getting into some learning mode but that has been disturbed and the, the covid pandemic has actually disadvantaged students in the rural places and so on because of lack of bandwidth lack of devices lack of infrastructure and so on so there is a very high negative impact on equity disruption in assessments end of year exams as you all know disrupt study progression graduation learning trajectories everything has been affected and increased flexibility as part of institutional responses is something that's required in future cognitive flexibility in terms of individuals and increased flexibility in terms of delivery of education delivery of learning styles and so on all that will be required in future times so what kind of universities do we have in the country we have state funded which are predominantly funded by the state government we have central funded where the funds come from the center we have state private funded institutions universities we have deemed universities private public domain we have deemed to be universities purely private domain specialized universities we have medical universities sanskrit universities languages tribal universities and most of the state universities are affiliation affiliating types and they therefore we have a large affiliation system in place where the university is responsible for most of the things and the institutions only run the curriculum of the universities we also have autonomous institutions which are non affiliation type private universities are non affiliation type and so on we also have you know, innovation universities universities of excellence and world class universities there can be a debate of whether we really need so many differentiations different you know differentials amongst education that debate can go on but the, but currently this is what we have now all this is being disrupted in some form or the other a university is a community of teachers and scholars as we all know and it must nurture academic freedom the fundamental tenets of a university must allow the student to explore and uh, you know create spirit of adventure and he also must innovate and knowledge and learning is the medium this is the medium through which he does all this a certificate of attainment attainment or a degree or a diploma or a certificate is the end result now the pandemic has actually changed the boundary conditions and therefore contours of traditional universities have been changing now there are several pressure points in within the university systems as we know today and we have inadequate faculty numbers we have poor faculty quality we have shrinking job opportunities the industry is collapsing it's getting into more and more of automation and therefore the base of the pyramid is collapsing and 
the COVID pandemic also has put in extra pressure on the system. Of course, each pressure point has a unique pressure release mechanism, and we need, to, and that's the change, change uh, dynamics that's in process today. So, so is that visible? Yes, sir, it is visible. Yes, sir. So we also have a diversity in delivery, which means we have two-year institutions, we have degree, diploma certifications, we have three-year, four-year, five-year, comprehensive institutions, we have technology-based institu institutions, research universities, innovation universities, single purpose, public, private, to a section 25, which was an older version, section eight, which was a recent 2013 onwards version. We have distance, online, language-based, and so many different uh, types of universities we have, and that's the diversity that we have. Whether this diversity is called for, is it good, is another debate again. Now, in the, the, if you compare the old universities, when the university started off in this country, they had almost all the de departments, all the disciplines on the same campus. People used to come together and they could create interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary kind of research development and so on. But with the discretization, with the separation of all these universe, technology separated, science separated, art separated, commerce separated, you know, that kind of uh, separation actually disaggregated the research quotient as well. And therefore we have research in silos, people don't meet together, even in a single university, people don't come together to create combined collaborative research, and therefore productization is a casualty. There are very few products that come out from this country. It's all because of the disaggregation of the uh, research uh, thought process and research infrastructure that we have in our universities. Therefore, what is the higher education sector? There are several statutory bodies like AICT, UGC, and so on. There are higher education institutions on one side, there's government on the other side, and there are professional associations. And the common areas between this is very, very interesting to understand. So what uh, the early universities, like I said, they nurtured all facets of education. They had humanities, liberal arts, social sciences, basic sciences, applied sciences, besides many others. For example, our technology curriculum today is more one dimensional hardly has very, uh, just has a very little percentage of humanities, probably nothing of liberal arts, nothing of social sciences and so on. And the curriculum, people are, the, the, the uh, requirement of uh, coding and the IT based uh, subjects has also cut down the basic sciences uh, to the bare minimum. And from a long-term perspective, I don't think this is, this is the way we should be going. There must be a proper combination of applied sciences with basic sciences, with liberal arts, social sciences, and so on. So therefore, it's very necessary that though the pandemic has disturbed or uh, disrupted the whole system, there is now a possibility to, to again re-engineer our entire education system. Now, pursuit of applied science and its applications, it, that grew several fold at the expense of the other disciplines. So therefore, it's, it's a concern that we must address. If one were to examine the influence of humanism on scholars in medicine, mathematics, astronomy, physics, one would perceive that humanism and university were a strong impetus for the scientific tempo and revolution. You can't make a good engineer without liberal arts, without social sciences, without basic sciences, without humanities, and so on. So therefore, there is something that needs to be done in that space. Our universities must open space for dialogue and inquiry, which is OSDE's uh, phenomena. 
So unless there is dialogue, unless there is inquiry, if you look at the ancient system, there has been a lot of debate that was stressed upon. People used to do rote learning, but what was interesting was the debate and one-to-one -one debate, one-to-many debate, and the, the uh, outcomes of such debate in terms of logical reasoning, in terms of analytics, was exemplary, which probably is missing in today's kind of learning that we have. Then critical engagement with different perspectives, in, you know, the informed thinking, reflective questions, responsible choices, and debriefing. These are all important activities in the process of learning, which we must get back to, which unfortunately is missing in our current system. Now, having talked about something about the university systems, let's look at one other aspect of a university system, which is a research. The research, the IPR, the patents that are filed, and so on. Let's see what is happening in that space. We produce hundreds of PhDs, thousands of research publications, probably the best in the country, best in the world. Our researchers are pretty good. They move with the best of the people. But what really happens is they all do not converge to any single team. And therefore, we get a lot of research, but hardly any products. There are no products that come out from Indian universities and so on. India has only 140 researchers per 1 million population, compared to 4,651 in the United States as on date. Now, this itself speaks of a, of a certain malaise within our system. Accounts for about 10% of all expenditure on research and development in Asia and the number of scientific publications, though it grew, it has much more has to happen in times to come in our research. Now let's see some of the uh, science, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the world renowned science uh, uh, magazines and science based uh, uh, bodies and their rankings. How do they perceive the engineering articles, science and engineering articles published in peer reviewed journals in 2018. If you look at this chart, China has a global share of 20.67% and they publish 5,28,000 uh, odd papers, uh, research publications. Whereas United States has a 16.54 percentage, India has just about 5.31 percent, and 1 lakh 35 thousand papers is what research articles is what they publish. Now this also is is a serious concern. Now if you look at the R&D in comparison by country, at the expenditure, the percentage of GDP, expenditure on R&D per capita in 2018 and so on, you, look, you will look again, the, you will see again that India, there is so much more to be done when you compare with Japan, with United States, with China, and so on. Now, you look at the patents applied and granted in 2018. If you look at the patents applied worldwide, China has 15.5 lakh patents applied and out of that, 4,32,000 patents are granted for China. For US, it's 5,97,000 which are applied and 3 lakhs are granted. The percentage grant is much higher for US. If you look at India, only 50,000 patents are applied for and we are granted hardly 13,900 patents. This also is a concern and there must be some change that happens within the university systems to correct this paradigm. Now, if you look at the publications themselves, increasing emphasis globally on producing co-authored research and publications. Believe me, people are not interested anymore in single author publications. They want co-authored publications where multiple ideas come in, collaborative research comes in, and interdisciplinary, inter, um, intradisciplinary, multidisciplinary kind of research comes in. 
So evidence suggests that internationally, co-authored articles in science and engineering are more frequently cited than single authored articles. Now that's the chain that we must learn to assimilate. The next success story is of alliance. Unless we forge alliances, the strategic alliances with global international partners, things may not really improve. The true nature of internationalization is the process of integrating international intercultural dimensions, which means on our campus, we must have international students, uh, we must have international faculty, not just for a day or two, but teaching an entire course for an entire semester. And these exchanges must happen both ways. So that's the forging alliances part, which will bring in cross-cultural advantages and benefits to the campus in India. Now, there is also lack of internationalization as a serious concern and affects global rankings. If you look at any major global ranking space, two things that stand out for an Indian university are the, are the internationalization and the research with the industry that translates into something tangible. We produce a lot of papers, a lot of articles, as you have seen, but they don't translate into anything that is tangible in terms of production. And in terms of internationalization, except for a very few, maybe single digit numbers of institutions, we do not have foreign students on the campus. We do not have foreign faculty on the campus. Now, therefore, what do we do? We, as we go along, this presentation also gives you some insight into what can be done. If you look at the Max Planck Society in Germany, it looks at basic research. The Max Planck Society operates several research institutions in Germany. On the day, the county is about 85. And they also operate Max Planck institutions outside Germany. Now, these institutions, they are independent, they're autonomous, and their selection and conduct of their research pursuits is also linked to the community requirements. And the Max Planck Institute it carries out basic research in life sciences, natural sciences, social and human sciences. And it's thus most almost impossible to allocate an individual institute to one single research field. So they are built on the premise that they will do collaborative research. Now they do not, uh, th these, these institutions in Germany, they are only based on Max Planck society or a Fraunhofer society, where one does the, one uh, is interested in the basic research, the other one is interested in using the basic research into an applied research and produce products. So that's something that we really need to do in our country as we go along. Front of a model earns about 70% of its income through contracts with industry or specific government projects. If you, if you look at the front of a society uh, established institution on a, let's say a thousand acre campus, you will see a central institution which has almost all the disciplines. And you also have on that campus, the extension research centers of all the major industries located on the campus. And there is research done involved in the community to find out what are the things that they need, what kind of innovations are required and so on. And that comes back to the institute, is channeled through the research centers that, uh, that are around the institution. And that is how the products are created. So thus the size of the society's budget would depend largely on its success of maximizing revenue and commissions. Everything that they produce is is looked at in terms of revenue generation and in terms of commissions, in, in terms of bringing a, a viable product into the market. And this serves both to drive the realization of a of society's strategic direction of becoming a leader in applied research. We do not have a single university that subscribes to this theory in India. 
Now, uh, moving out from a little from the research part, we also need people who, are, who have competency-based based skills built through our systems. And the National Skill Qualification Framework, which I happen to have designed way back in 2013, when I was at AICT, also talks about multiple pathways where skills and education are built together and they, they divided into several certification levels. And one can travel from uh, a school system to a college to a you know, skills-based institution uh, through a certification to a diploma, to a degree, to a post-graduation, if they so desire, or drop out at any point uh, in of the certification and uh, be employable with the skills that are available at that certification level. Now, these are some of the things that must be institutionalized without, within our university systems. We have good systems in place, but the operational part seems to be lacking. The last mile problem is always a problem in this country. Now, let's look at the quality aspect of our universities. First of all, we all understand what is accreditation, a process to evaluate and recognize an institution for meeting peer developed standards. There is an assessment process, which is systematic in higher education and uses empirical data on student learning to refine programs and improve student learning. So there's a feedback mechanism that is available. There is a ranking system that's also used globally. And also in India, we have started NIRF, National Institutional Ranking Framework. Ranking is based on comparable performance indicators or what we call it. We have a set of indicators and we compare that across the institutions, across disciplines, across countries, and so on. And we will get a relative position of the university vis-a-vis -vis others based on the league tables that are created. Now, whether we should have a separate NIRF is again a debatable point or whether we look at we should look at the global rankings and so on every country has certain differences in the way they uh, do the teaching learning process the way they deliver the outcomes and so on but then uh, when you are measuring on a global platform probably a global scale is something that's uh, that will be required uh, the whole world is now moving away from the accreditation process they're getting into quality assurance and the maintenance of a desired level of quality and service of product, especially by means of attention to every stage of the process is quality assurance. Uh, very simply put, what it means is you have created as a part of accreditation, you have created program outcomes, you have created uh, course outcomes. And uh, when the peer team comes in to visit your institution, they, are, they try and measure the outcomes and so on. Now, the question is, how do you measure them? How do you know that the uh, outcomes, the course outcomes are actually met, the program outcomes are actually met? And if somebody can assure that, then we are actually moving into a space called quality assurance. And that is the future. People will stop talking about accreditation, assessment, ranking, and so on. And they will only talk about quality assurance. If you have assured a certain quality, are you in a position to deliver that? And if you are not able to deliver that, then the institutions will be liable to be sued for a certain uh, amount. Now, which is actually happening in some of the universities in the US as we are read, um, making this presentation today. The evolution of accreditation, as you all know, we started off with an open loop system where certain inputs were there, certain outputs were there. And we assumed that if the inputs are there, then the output will automatically be there. Then currently we are in closed loop system where uh, we talk about the measuring the course outcome, measuring the program outcomes, and uh, taking some feedback and trying to correct the closed loop and so on. In future, we are the world is has already moved into adaptive uh, kind of accreditation process, where every single element there is a closed loop, and and the outcomes of every single element is measured in that uh, space. For example, the infrastructure has certain inputs, certain outcomes. Faculty has certain inputs, certain outcomes. So there is a closed loop around every single element. 
and like i said all these things will give way to quality assurance so what does the student uh, need out of all this a student will need scholarship not the money part of it the scholarship of learning the scholarship of integration the scholarship of teaching the scholarship of discovery the scholarship of application these are the things that a student looks at and these are the things that will be measured in times to come so there are several global rankings available in the world so what i'll do is uh, several uh, on the right on the left side if you see there are several ranking agencies in the world uh, one of them uh, is the high impact universities research performance index leaden ranking the newsweek professional ranking qs world university rankings and so on now what i'll do is i have i have a small video the and which will be uh, the universities the uh, world today uh this will probably take about 3 minutes you so, turn out uh, pardon this voice is disturbed sir you can go ahead sir yeah. you can continue sir are you are you able to listen yes sir yes, yes sir. sir yes sir you can go ahead sir sir please continue sir please sir Uh, good morning sir please continue the webinar sir so the screen is visible so that 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 gives you some peek into the top 10 universities in the us Uh, now going further you have qs asian university rankings you have latin american university rankings you have reuters top 100 university rankings and so on now each one has a different metrics some of them measure the research 
potential. Some of them measure the products that come out from the universities. Some of them are the leading, you know, uh, based on uh, average of rankings of different ranking bodies and so on. So you also have Times Higher Education World University rankings. You have rankings based on reputation. You have university rankings based on uh, you know top 2000 institutions where science metrics measurement is used and so on so th then you also have webometrics you have one university rankings one has been in in the news for for all the wrong reasons in the they also have one university which stands incidentally among the top 50 in the world and they have a research center for chinese science evaluation and uh, they provide data on journal article publications and so on. And we recently have also started the National Institutional Ranking Framework, NIRF. The idea of showing these slides is there are several ranking agencies looking at different aspects of uh, delivery of education and the parameters that influence education. But each one of them has a specific role to play. So. The what uh, having looked at the quality, the research, and uh, the other parameters of a university system, we'll now look at what exactly is the new education paradigm post COVID 2019. Now, there is a huge uh, integration of education and technology that is going to happen, has already happened because of the blended learning or, or the online learning that, that seems to be taking over um, almost every single delivery mode. So education and technology integration will happen. Can we have education without technology? Can technology uh, really assist education process and so on? So therefore, there are several trends and paradigms that are happening. Service delivery is something which is important. Deregulation, liberalization, privatization, entrepreneurial university, which, which we need universities which promote entrepreneurship and so on. Stakeholder relationship, the community must be involved in the university. The stakeholders, the industry, the alumni, they all must be involved within the university functioning. Philosophy they will be the lifelong learning, methodology will be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, active learning, e-learning, and so on. In the, within the service delivery, you have borderless education, you have academic mobility, you will be able to share your credits, shift from maybe you take uh, two, three courses from certain university, three, four courses from another university, and then mix them, mix and match them, and you get your own degree, and so on. All these things will happen in uh, future. Harmonization, convergence will, will be need, will needed to be done. Quality assurance, like I said, accreditation, they, are, they become important. As far as the governance is concerned, accountability and transparency will be the prime requirements. So the work now is all changing. Traditional work, to home and work, the new world of work, post-COVID, this is something which will be very, very interesting to follow in times to come. So most of the applications in future uh, whether it's an online university, a traditional university, or a mixed university, or whatever will happen, most of the applications will be mobile RFID-based applications. Then most of the applications will also be sensor-based, sensor network-based. Like, for example, we do in patient health monitoring, body sensor networks. We'll have many research groups. Uh, coming together, like I said, collaborative research, and so on. And everything, uh, the data sharing happening on a mobile device or a smart device, the outdoors, the office, house, factory, classroom, everything will be connected together, and so on. Even the agricultural technologies will be completely networked with a farmer, to field data, to climate data, to automation, to working units, to industry, to services, everything coming on an agricultural network. So 
let's look at what happens in future for in terms of an industry now most of the time we have been talking about an industry where we have people working with machines to produce something there was a time when in, in when the um, machines they started becoming more and more intelligent in terms of automation and so on and people were men were or the people operating it were talking to machines in some uh, limited fashion because of the intelligence that's built into the machines now there is a third stage of that or a fourth stage of that where machines will talk to machines and that's industry 4.0 so the full integration of information and communication technology and automation technology it will be the factories of the future now if you look at the internet minute it's very very interesting if you look <clears throat> in facebook on a facebook we have 1.3 million logins every single minute 19 million texts are sent 1.6 million swipes are made almost 2 lakh people are tweeting every single minute and 2.5 million snaps are created and so on so this is the speed at which things are moving and therefore our university university systems also have to keep pace there's a digital around the world uh, in 2019 and if you look at the st statistics it will tell you a story of the how uh, aligned our universities are with the outside world so there are, there is an urbanization there is a uh, mobile user penetration there is internet use, user penetration the active social media users and mobile social media user penetration all these things are changing by the minute and probably by the time that i have made this presentation all these percentages must have changed now the fundamentally you have internet of things you have several sensors all the communicating devices coming together on the network so you giving you digitized services giving you industry 4.0 smart products smart factories and on the other side you have product innovations process innovations autonomous agents or ai artificial intelligence digital networking and so on so therefore in order to bridge this gap you will need labor 4.0 now uh, industry 4.0 will affect almost every single aspect of a value chain be it global communication infrastructure enterprise resource planning or asset management or industrial communication security human resources digital manufacturing everything will be affected by in the value chain everything will be affected because of the digitization in industry 4.0 so our labs and universities must also keep pace and the next generation labs that every university every institution must have are uh, probably the code labs the pop up studios the cloud innovation labs the like gaming garages marker space maker spaces uh, innovation uh, venture development centers robo rides ai parts and so on these are the things that will define beat mechanical engineering beat civil engineering beat electrical there won't be this compartmentalized learning anymore people have to come together and talk about products and innovation and so on so with these changes happening what are the skills that are required so the skills required if you look at the essential skills map i have uh, an engineering sector a data science sector a product sector finance sector marketing and managerial sector each of these sector will have business skills require requirement technology skills requirement and data skills requirement so if i am looking at for example financial sector i will need in, within the business skills i need mathematical finance financial modeling financial engineering with the technical skills i'll require microsoft excel vba algorithmic trading visual analytics with the data set skills requirement i'll need forecasting business analytics data visualization so this map will tell you generally what are the skills that are required and how your curriculum must be must be re engineered in order to meet the skill requirement now future jobs as far as they are concerned there will be 
a lot of opportunities but the healthcare economy your data ai cloud computing sales you know product development green tech all these things will have future job requirements and they will require future skill sets as well and something else will happen within the industry sector the red dots that you are seeing here are the jobs which will which will which will be out probably in the next 4 5 years arts you know accommodation and food service the all these will will change over a period of time retail trade and the construction the low end jobs will be hard hit in these sectors health and uh, uh, you know the government sector the uh, every sector will need higher order skills and the low skilled jobs will be hardest hit by covid 19 Uh, pandemic because more and more automation will come into the system and students can become job and future ready unless they uh, do you know good uh, undergraduate programs they uh, do training with top industry partners they also do guided projects use uh, marketing brand kits uh, like canva and so on and then also get into the skill for hands on skills companies like axis bank infosys tata communications for skill sets for career success and also come back into the system and uh, upgrade skills so this is the future of work we in a nutshell it looks at underlying drivers the are the economic structure the labor displacement the emerging landscape and on the other side you will see connectivity machine capabilities demographic social expectations modularization globalization and so on when you look at, at education becomes availability open education continuous learning peer learning these are the trends and the future of work that we will see and our universities must be uh, dynamic enough to absorb the future requirements of work there is a rise in technology integrated courses designed to impart employability skills so we need uh, in every sector you need uh, skills which are different in it we have hot skills like javascript java rust pandas python cyber security blockchain and so on within business and it skills you have enterprise asset management customer care within a construction sector you need for project and portfolio management building information modeling within the finance sector you need core banking corporate lending these are the areas which are required now apart from these hard skills all that i have spoken about are hard skills you will also need several soft skills complex problem solving critical thinking creativity people management coordinating with others you know service orientation negotiation cognitive flexibility ability to fit into different you know job spaces that's extremely important in future and the entire paradigm of learning is moving into blended learning because of pandemic or uh, no pandemic even when the pandemic will subside probably we will see blended learning as a part of university education in future so individuals today if you look at the uh, individual learning mode they are they learn anywhere they learn in airline queues they learn in queue ca cafes they learn uh, through video tutorials in subways in buses and so on and all they use is a smart device a phone so therefore learning styles are changing learning material is changing outcomes are changing skill sets required are changing industry is changing so therefore universities have to change so and there is also a growing need for micro learning no longer those 40 minutes one hour lectures and 80 minute lectures 60 minute lectures these all these are passe you need short relevant contextualized personalized uh, modules also possible on mobile where they can store people students can go back at their free time open the link again again learn and so on so that's something that we as teachers must also change so teachers role will become go from you know a teacher to a guide to a mentor and so on so that transition for a teacher also is pretty difficult so we all know why why online why blended and so on 
the digital content we have is in, must be interactive, must be characteristic, clear, global, realistic, emotional. There must be an emotional connect. And the future of learning probably will be digital learning blended, like I said. A part of it will be face-to-face, -face, a part of it will be still done in the labs because everything can't be virtual in an applied science medium. Access through various devices is a reality. Big data management, because so many the data analytics will be required, student data analytics will be required, faculty data analytics will be required. Uh, the, you will really need to understand the slow learners, the fast learners, so, and give them adequate uh, you know, learning possibilities and, and so on. So successful digital learning is something that will keep happening in time to come. There are several open online courses available, XMOOC, CMOOC, DOCC, VOC, we have SMO, SPOC, NOOC, and so on. NOOC is something that you will see in uh, any standard platform like Coursera or edX or Udemy and so on. Nano open online courses, they are meant to empower learners to learn on the essentials, scale or area of knowledge at a time within 20 learning hours or less. In order to engage these uh, students' uh, uh, you know, attention, you will need to see that the learning is not uh, 40 minutes, one hour, and so on. You can't engage in an asynchronous mode of learning. You will need to see that your learning is kept very short. So most of these modules are um, 10 hour, 12 hour, 15 hours modules, but very, very short and uh, uh, based on uh, uh, nano open online concept. You will also need a uh, learning management system for delivery of these systems and keep track of students' performance, faculty performance, and so on. So there are many learning management systems available. And along with the content, there is Swayam of the Government of India initiative. We have Edex, Coursera, Khan Academy, Udemy, Canvas, FutureLearn and so on. You also, now in future, uh, if, if you have to have blended learning as something that will go into the future, then obviously you will really, uh, you will need to uh, understand the dynamics of this. Possibly 45,000 colleges, 1,000 universities cannot subscribe to, each one subscribe to online, many times duplication and things like that. So you will really need to look at a new paradigm like new MOOCs aggregator, four or five institutions coming together and then subscribing to a content using sharing the resources. Probably your institution is very good in physics. Some other institution is very good in mathematics. You share faculty, share content, share co online content, share face-to-face -face lectures. Every, everything will be shared and on and MOOCs will act as an aggregator. So the value chain will be very different in time to come. So the long-term changes probably we'll see 70-30 uh, mode as a as something that that will happen as a matter of fact, 70 face to face and 30 uh, blend, uh, online uh, learning assessments and all those things can happen online. Technology is available. There is nothing uh, like uh, a student who is not seen can uh, get into unfair practices and so on. The technology can take care of that, and therefore those uh, things are. Uh, can be taken care of by technology. So teaching and learning uh, will undergo a change, like I said. The future of learning will be full-fledged online programs leading to certificate, diploma, degrees, and so on. There will be an intelligent mix and match of online modules aligned to value-added courses, uh, you know, for industry professionals, for upskilling, reskilling, and so on. Targeted specialized courses will also come in customer built certificate diplomas. I mean, a student should be allowed to build his own diploma, his own degree. So a lot of content is available. He picks up what he wants to learn, puts all that together, creates certain competency-based skills, and that is how the future probably will go. And com complete online assessment and quality assurance is something that will be there. So the universities of future, the final two, three uh, slides that I have, will require a change of business model, cooperative structures, enhancing interdisciplinary nature of learning, new concepts for faculties or departments. The traditional systems will be disrupted and we must be ready to accept that 
change. The accreditation process will itself change into quality assurance. Change of teaching methods will be there. Uh, fixed degree programs may not be there. Like um, I mean, they certainly will be there. But there is a new clientele that will grow into which will design their own uh, degree programs, their own diploma programs, and uh, and the uh, online and the blended learning environment will environment will make that happen. Uh, new teaching concepts will be required. New teaching infrastructures will be required. AR, uh, VR facilities facilitation must be done. The augmented reality, the virtual reality, those systems will come in into as as infrastructure requirement. Digital rights management will become extremely important, and changing the learning itself will change from a massive versus personalized learning uh, paradigm. New learning infrastructure will be required, and and so on. So then, <clears throat> the virtual university concept will eventually come in. The, the opportunity for overcoming the limitations of traditional learning. So you will not need really need a brick and mortar institution, 25 acres, 50 acres to build an institution, to build a university, and so on. Probably the economics may not allow in times to come for that to happen. What we will probably see more and more is of virtual university, and we and it's also not necessary that. Everybody starts building a virtual university. A virtual university can exist anywhere. Its content can go anywhere because it's all virtual and the content is just transmitted on a, on a network and the learning happens on a network. So the target audience for a virtual university is probably everybody. There are students, there are entrepreneurs, there are technology-based people, there are technology leaders, there are creators of platform, ecosystems almost everybody is an audience for a term for a virtual university so the changing landscape will look at a new competition between long distance competition how you how do you deliver that content franchisee universities probably will come in corporate universities will probably come in in which looks at this technology change paradigm that we have spoken about and in any case the universities must also build the sustainable development goals. There are 17 goals of that into the new university system. So finally, yukti, yuktam, pragrhuniyat, baladapi vichakshanaha, ravera vishayam, vastu, kim, na deepaha, prakashaye. Which means that the wise should learn to accept wisdom from anybody, even from a child. Doesn't the small night lamp light up things which the sun cannot? Therefore, there are no boundaries for education. Only from a teacher, only from an established uh, teacher uh, in a certain environment and so on. The learning can happen anywhere, anytime, and in any mode and through anyone. So that's the, uh, the future education spirit. And there is a perspective to all this. If you look at, you know, this this uh, slide will tell you that perspective. Just because you are right does not mean I am wrong. You just haven't seen life from my side. So therefore, in order to really learn the the in the new environment that we are seeing today evolving because of the pandemic and other pressures, there is a perspective and we cannot miss the perspective. There is nothing like the other fellow is right or I am right. Depending on the context, he may be right. Depending on another context, I may be right. And that's how we evolve and that's how we learn. Now, all that I have spoken about comes in these references. And this is the place where you can contact me in future. And therefore, I end my... Uh, presentation here and thank you for uh, uh, giving me an ear and uh, uh, so my my pleasure to have interacted with you all thank you so much and back to the organizer really thankful to dr dr ss Munta. thank you sir you have given such an uh, outstanding uh, delivery of your uh, presentation today uh, we really learned learned so many things from your uh, presentation right from uh, 
accreditation uh, right from the teaching learning process uh, the various uh, the ranking methodologies which are being employed in the various institutions and uh, the virtual uh, learning and your flipped learning model i think uh, iit bombay has already implemented that many of the uh, institutions are impl uh, implementing that flipped uh, learning model and really this uh, covid has given uh, given like kind of reboot for the education so we are uh, looking at various uh, new methodologies for uh, implementing uh, and delivering the education and really you have really given uh, such wonderful uh, insights like uh, uh, pooling the resources together uh, and having one common uh, resource wherein few institutions will be good in certain things and few will be good in certain things and with respect to accreditation really uh, thankful to you as our uh, institution is going for accreditation your uh, uh, valuable thoughts and suggestions uh, really helpful and the final uh, slide which you told you can learn from anyone i am not able to recollect the exact sanskrit words you told but uh, really um, uh, that the uh, is really the what the way forward see i learn many things from my students and uh, from my colleagues from my students from my seniors i really thank uh, thankful to you sir also thankful to our uh, trustee professor jaisima who has taken his time off to attend this uh, webinar i think sir would have also really liked it uh, our head of the department uh, professor vikramaditya our organizing team dr venkatesh iitripli student coordinator uh, sorry iitripli branch co counselor dr venkatesh my beloved students i should really thank saurav and veena and uh, these students have really been such a like right hand and left hand to me for uh, conducting this uh, webinars uh, over to you veena please uh, take up the question answer session and uh... thank you sir uh, so i'll be moderating the question and answer session so any questions can be posted in the comment box which i'll be asking to uh, professor mantra here Thank you uh, once again, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, sir, uh, the first question is: uh, Why are research fundings? Uh, why are fundings in research limited only to premier institutes? <clears throat> no, it's uh, it's not uh, 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 limited to premier institutions. It's probably limited to the best of the uh, research proposals, uh, and. Yes, some of the uh, funding institutions uh, happen to be within the uh, either the state-funded uh, institutions or the government-funded institutions. Now, uh, it, that doesn't mean that the private institutions are not funded because uh, a lot of good proposals are received from there as well, and they are also funded. And the percentage happens to be a little higher for the government and government-funded uh, institutions. Now, the idea is uh, we have a limited uh, funding. and the uh, fund the funds that are distributed by the government most of the time belongs to the uh, taxpayer it's it's a taxpayer's money and therefore uh, it probably uh, is looked at uh, from the perspective of uh, how best it is utilized and and so on and therefore uh, the government institutions which uh, have to uh which are also have to keep the uh, fee pegged uh, down and and so on they don't have other means of uh, creating their own resources so they will have to be funded uh, for conducting the research but it's not true that the private sector is not funded for uh, research uh, uh, proposals and so on good proposals wherever they come from uh, will always find some money from somewhere thank you sir and the second question is what are the modifications required to improve indian technical education system in india to get more patents and quality publications no like i said uh, there, there are no simple answers for uh, that uh, question the idea is it's, it's a process research is like a practicing a religion the uh, when i when i practice my religion i kind of uh, become fanatical you know i i i must uh, own up my religion and and work through that so that applies to every every uh, body probably now having said that research is like that unless you build uh, research into an institution's uh, dna it doesn't happen and uh, the problem selection 
must be such that interdisciplinary and uh, multidisciplinary research happens it's very difficult to bring in all the departments to work together and create uh, a content which can translate into something that's tangible viable to manufacture to be manufactured and so on so therefore it's very necessary that unless you build that kind of ecosystem where the problem selection is based on the community requirements and then you build the uh, the infrastructure on that basis and you allow make people come together you, why can't the students come together and work with the uh, faculty in terms of building research in terms of building uh, ideas innovative solutions and so on so somewhere the research culture must come in as a matter of uh, you know fact of life into an institution i mean there are, there is a lot of debate on uh, good research institutions uh, should be built or good teaching institutions should be built or good research institutions that also do teaching or teaching institutions that also do research this kind of debate keeps happening but my own belief is that every teacher must be involved in some kind of research which uh, which of course apply, apply, is applicable in terms of some value proposition uh, because uh, the amount of work that they do in order to create something innovative will always help them in the teaching within the classroom so the the today the information is something that that's flowing all around to everybody over the net and so on so the students are also as good or as bad as as the teacher so unless the teacher makes extra efforts to get across uh, to uh, the student and his uh, kind of uh, queries the uh, teaching doesn't become effective the student would always feel probably uh, not happy with the kind of uh, things that are happening within the classroom so all those things can be addressed only if the teacher is also facilitated to do research given some time given some objectives given some uh, timelines and asked to produce something which is tangible not just publish a paper so that's that ecosystem an institution will have to build over a period of time that's how research uh, grows otherwise research happens in silos yeah please thank you sir and the next question is uh, is there any possibility of inclusion of research methodology in ug level no i see this this is a the, i mean i don't see any reason why somebody can't introduce research methodology at the undergraduate level as long as it's connected to a little bit of uh, innovation time that the students are given within their uh, schedule now you one might say that there is a university system i am an affiliated institution so university sets everything how can i teach research methodology the university has doesn't have that as a part of the syllabus and so on i mean this is all uh, nice for uh, you know a uh, tea time uh, debate uh, which universe even if it is an affiliated system which university will stop you from creating from teaching research methodology if you if at all you want to teach that uh, as an audit course so uh, you create a certain uh, time frame and uh, you can teach any subject for that matter uh, as a, as additional uh, credits which are uh, not uh, which are not actually they, which are looked at as audit uh, uh, credits but not you know uh, getting into the uh, final uh, mark sheet so uh, there is no reason why you can't do it if it is an autonomous institute you create your own curriculum then there should be any uh, any problem of doing that if it is an affiliated institution you still can do it as an audit course so therefore my view is uh, that all, all these uh, things can be done provided you have a uh, you have a uh, need uh, to that and you progress that course of study into something uh, tangible which which is which, like for example if you are teaching research research methodology you also create a fab lab uh, for the uh, student where 
365 24 by 7 it's available to him and he can try out his ideas you can try out his innovation and do some uh, reading and so on so that ecosystem also must be created within the uh, within the institution yes please Uh, and the next question is is participating in hackathons advice to students to uh, to cultivate innovation among students see innovation can happen anyway it's it's no innovation is not creating a new product innovation can happen in anything anything that you are doing if you can do it better more efficiently with less energy used is innovation if you can improve a process which you are doing earlier through some means and if you can improve that through some other means that is innovation so therefore uh, hackathon and uh, those uh, kind of uh, initiatives they help you to start thinking develop your uh, analytical abilities your uh, ability to look beyond the subject and so on so therefore they are useful they in their they all have a have a place but in themselves they can create a good innovator is something that i don't uh, really believe a lot of other things have to happen along with that and then you will have uh, maybe you will have to set up a, a startup uh, innovation center within the institution create ideas i mean get people to participate in debates create new ideas and uh, create a pool of uh, startup ideas in your own institution maybe it comes from a student it comes from a faculty it comes from an on teaching faculty whatever you create that uh, uh, pool of uh, ideas and then you take it to the next level uh, of uh, creating the designs around it creating the concepts and uh, so on and then you tie them up with your fabrication shops create a prototype and then you cre create a venture capital uh, hand holding that can happen so this entire ecosystem of startup ideas will have to be built within the institution and you can have tie ups with csir labs with drdo labs with any lab around maybe institution across the next door and so on so that's how things move it's it's not because of one single activity or two single activities and, and anything else yes so the last question is how to improve uh, nerf ranking in of an institute How to improve? N I R F NIRF ranking. N I R F ranking. No, uh, N I R F ranking. If you look at the parameters, look at each of the parameter, look at the last ranking that you have, and for each of the parameter, you draw a chart where you have parameters on one end, and you have year. on uh, different columns so for the last 3 or 5 years you first of all draw a matrix of marks that you have got for each parameter and then you see how you have progressed and then you find out what are the uh, boundary conditions to improve each parameter and then you may, you figure out uh, in the next cycle what you will have to do to improve that particular parameter for example it's a perception perception is dependent on several parameters look at what kind of marks you have got in the last 5 years and find out where you have gone wrong and or in short you create a gap study like you do a research analysis in research methodology you do a gap study so for every parameter you you find out what you have what you must be having to improve that and what is that gap and how will you bridge the gap now once you do this for all the 1000 odd parameters you will understand you you will realize what what extra needs to be done in order to improve the ranking but the idea should not be only to improve the ranking ranking is a is a mat, ma, is a is a number game <clears throat> so therefore your idea should be to bring in some intrinsic changes some intrinsic value propositions rather than play on the numbers yes. uh, thank you sir 
Thank you, sir. On behalf of the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, Savidya Institute of Technology, and IEEE SVIT student branch, I would like to thank you for your talk on Indian edu Indian technical uh, education system. Time yes, uh, and oh, and emphasizing. The thank you, sir. I would like to thank uh, today's speaker, Professor Manta, for his talk on Indian technical education system and emphasizing the importance of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary systems in today's education and giving us an insight into the Gurukula system and showing us how our universities can overcome their downfalls and giving us the most important features of the 21st century learning and the future of learning and blended learning. I would wish to express my gratitude to Professor YJ Simma Dean Academics, SVIT, for his valuable support. I would like to express my gratitude to our principal, Dr. Ramesh Babu, for his encouragement and support. I'm very grateful to Dr. Narayan, IEEE advisor and Dean R&D for giving us this opportunity to organize this webinar. I thank Professor Vikram Aditin, the head, head of Department, Electronics and Communication Engineering, for his valuable support. I would like to thank Dr. Venktesh, branch counselor, for his constant guidance. I would like to thank all, all the participants who have attended the webinar. And I would like to thank the webinar com committee for its contribution and support. Thank you, everyone. Thank you also. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I would request all the participants to please fill in the uh, uh, feedback forms to receive the e-certificate.